So good afternoon and welcome to the Humanity Center Tuesday lecture series virtually. Um, I'm Hannah Holtzman, the Keck Postdoctoral Fellow in the Humanity Center. And it's my great pleasure to introduce this four week series, Care for Our Common Home, Environmental Justice and Sustainability Across Disciplines. So each week we're going to focus on a particular theme with speakers from the arts, humanities, sciences and social sciences to have a real multidisciplinary liberal arts approach um, to the climate crisis and the urgent challenges it poses for humanity and for the planet, and also to some of the more local concerns um, here at University of San Diego. So this week, our first speaker, Andrew Terrell, will establish connections between some of the major themes addressed in this series. So Andrew Terrell will talk about some of our uh, major themes together, so water, food, energy, and climate. And our second speaker, Kate Borsma, will focus more specifically on water and adapting to life without it today. Next week, uh, Megan Weatherden and I will speak about different aspects of energy, sort of broadly conceived, and justice. And October 13th, Aaron Gross and Michelle Boudrias will talk about food justice and sustainability in the context of University of San Diego um, in particular. And then our final session on October 20th will feature Ursula Heise from the UCLA Department of English and Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, and Jeffrey Stuker, a visual artist and filmmaker based in Los Angeles, both talking about extinction narratives and mediations and multi-species justice. Our first speaker today, Dr. Andrew Terrell, earned a JD from Columbia University and a PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Polit uh, Political Science and International Relations and teaches a range of courses related to environmental politics, human rights, and sustainable development. His research focuses on environmental justice, natural resource management, marine policy, and the Arctic. And current active projects include research into environmental justice at the Mexico-US border, fisheries management policy, and environmental impacts on the development of human society. So I'm going to pass it, uh, pass the screen over to Dr. Terrell. I'm so so excited to be here. Um, thanks everyone for coming uh, virtually to, to have, I think what's in a very important discussion, um, this entire series, we're, we're obviously approaching a, um, a, some points of no return um, in, in the coming, I want to say decades, but if I'm honest, it, it might be years. And so it's important that we start thinking about the decisions we're making now. Um, I'm going to cite a scholar named uh, Kate Rayworth, who um, has been thinking a lot about the decisions we're making and the way she put it is the decisions we make over the next 50 years will decide, I'm paraphrasing here, will decide what happens over the next 10,000 years. So we have some weighty decisions ahead of us. And I'm going to focus um, specifically on the water, food, energy, climate nexus. Um, this nexus keeps growing. Uh, yeah, originally, there are some folks who just thought about it as either the water food nexus or the water energy nexus. Uh, then at water food energy, there was a realization that these, these things are all interconnected. And of course, um, everything more or less is connected with climate these days because of the way we've um, decided to grow and develop our, our society. So I want to start with asking a question, what is sustainable development? Because when when Kate Rayworth says we have to think about our decisions over the next 50 years. She's talking about decisions uh, around how we develop our society. And really that's maybe the, the problem is, uh, are we going to choose development um, rather than growth? So I, I wanna frame this a bit with a, a brief discussion, very, very brief. Um, the, the kind of the gold standard definition for sustainable development, not that there aren't any competing ones, but the, the one that is most often cited was developed by the Brundtland Commission, which uh, back in the 80s spent a lot of time thinking about this, and they came up with the definition, um, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And I, that, that bold is my bold, um, and I, I emboldened needs because I wanted to point out that the, uh, this is a good definition, but the, the trouble is how we define that word needs. Because things that used to be luxuries, things that used to be, wow, what a wonder, 
um, they be, these things become needs as we get used to them. And so one question we have to ask ourselves going forward is what can we um, think about changing that might recognize limitations uh, that we that we'll have to respect natural limitations um, limitations in of how how we allow our society to grow can we reconceive recon some of the things that we now describe as needs as luxuries and I'll, I'll get to that in a bit especially at the end we'll have a bit a bit of a you know a few cases we can think about and wonder you know do we need to um, kind of reconstruct our, our understanding of what that word means what we need and i don't mean that that we would want to go to a bare bone bone survival mode but put another way if we don't rein in some of our consumption we will be forced to a bare bone survival mode that is we can do it on our own terms and try to reconceptualize a lot of um, what we demand right now or we can allow climate change to make that decision for us and it will be brutal and it will be um, very unpleasant and it will be specifically unpleasant um, for, for some people more than others. And so there's a justice component here as well. So I said this was about growth versus development, which is another way of saying quantity versus quantity or more versus better. But one of the mistakes that, that Kate Rayworth has, has um, pointed out, as, as have others, um, Herman Daly and many, many others, is that we've decided on a path of growth where GDP is sort of determining everything about how we measure, you know, whether we're pro making progress. And we really ought to focus on development and put another way is we've allowed our understanding of what a good life is to be completely dictated by our ability to continue to grow all, all aspects of society, not just the economic aspects, but just everything is predicated on growth. And we know that that's not always the case, um, that growth is better. We recognize this in many spheres of our lives that we would rather not have growth. And this sort of the, the maybe bit tired example is the, the worst kind of, one of the worst kinds of growth um, that we all, you know, at some point in our lives probably come into contact with either unfortunately ourselves or maybe more unfortunately in some cases our loved ones is cancer and that is unchecked growth. So we know that producing um, cells in the body um, it, it's not a, a, a case of more is better. We know there are some cases where, many cases where you would want to balance. Um, you would want some growth and then you would want to focus more on development. Uh, an example that's been used is trees grow quite a bit in their early part of their life cycle. They want to make sure to you know, have a big spurt so they can get past the stage where they're very vulnerable. They grow up tall quickly and then they stop growing and that's all the better because they start focusing on other aspects of being a tree. Um, flowering, you know, producing fruit, um, becoming more uh, resilient against disease and against um, in, in insects and other parasites. And that's good that they don't keep growing. If they keep focused on just growing taller and taller, they would become more and more vulnerable. And so there are, you know, lots of cases in the, the natural world in our own lives where we recognize it would be better to focus on quality rather than quantity. And yet we allow our ec economic system to be, to be driven by quantity and we um, increasingly think of more and more consumption as uh, the measure of how well our society is progressing. And so Ray Rayworth puts it in terms of shifting from 20th century economics, which took a really hard turn, uh, you know, leaning into growth and, and versus developing a 21st second century economics that is more about understanding how we can improve the quality of our lives, which may include restraining growth. We might, we are in fact very likely to have higher quality lives in the long run, and maybe even the short run now that we are as far along as we are with climate change by restraining growth, which is not how we think about things um, right now. And so the new goal we might set, set is thriving in balance. We do want to thrive. This isn't about depriving ourselves. It's about finding that balance that will allow us to thrive without risking um, either short-term or long-term ruin. So uh, this is Ray, what Ray was, came up with. Um, it's called the donut. You might have come across this, maybe, maybe not. It's confusing at first, but um, hopefully I can explain it in a, 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 a 
you know, pretty uh, straightforward way. And it's actually pretty easy under, uh, to understand once you get the, the, the concept. The inner, the green donut is sort of the dividing line. The inner part um, represents places where we're not able to, we have shortfalls, we're not able to meet needs. And so you might notice that all of the, the, uh, uh, the different sections that are in the green part are, are, are basically human needs, you know, need for um, some real basics, water, food, energy, and that's what we'll be focusing on, but also health, education, uh, income, um, peace and justice, uh, the ability to have political voice, equity, equ gender equality, housing, uh, networks. There are all kinds of things that are sort of human needs and you can um, kind of think of Maslow's hierarchy as well uh, when you think of this um, meeting those, those human needs. But unfortunately, we haven't met all those needs. You can see various shortfalls there, but we've also, in attempting to meet these needs, we've actually overshot the ecological ceiling. So our social foundation, you can see that's the inner dark green circle is not so good, but we've also overshot our ceiling and, and see that the red, the red the sort of pie wedges there are where we've done an especially um, frightful job of, of putting ourselves in danger with things like climate change, biodiversity loss, um, nitrogen and phosphorus loading and land conversion. And a lot of these things, if you're thinking now about water, food and energy and climate change, you can probably get a sense that a lot of these overshoots are directly related to, to those problems. Um, you know, nitrogen loading because we've poured nitrogen-based fertilizers onto our crops in order to, to get more yield. Um, biodiversity loss because we've, uh, you know, in order to get more yield poured, in some cases, poured pesticides onto those crops. Um, land conversion in order to produce more food. You could do this also with, with water, I and mean, that's just focusing on food. Um, the conversion of forests into farmland fueling climate change, but you could do the same for water and for energy. And so this is a puzzle. How can we possibly meet all these needs if we're already overshooting and not meeting needs? And this um, gets to what Rayworth points out, which is by focusing on GDP, we are both risking economic ruin and we are creating massive inequality. So the reason why we're not able to have a, that good social foundation is not because we are not consuming enough. It's because we've adopted a system where we accept that some in the world will vastly overconsume, consume and others won't have enough and we've not distributed our resources very well. And you can imagine the sort of 20th century political and economic arguments that have led us there. And at the point where I said we haven't distributed things well, um, some folks might think, well, if this, uh, I'm hoping it's not as true anymore, but if this were the 1960s, 70s or 80s, um, I might be finding myself on some kind of blacklist because I'm getting dangerously close to saying the word redistribution, which um, probably held us back for a long time. But it is true that we have, we are projecting resources into areas where we don't have need and allowing massive shortfalls. Um, and, and that is a, a, a euphemistic way of saying allowing people to suffer because they don't have enough. And at the same time, we have overshot our use of resources. Actually, it's not really our use of resources that's the problem here. It's the waste product. And notice that most of these problems that of going past an ecological ceiling have more to do with the waste we produce in using resources. We're not going to run out of resources in many of these cases. Uh, for example, if we run out of oil, the, that won't be the big problem that we're out of oil. It will be that we've burned so much oil and created so much waste from oil that we've done terrible things to the balance of our climate. So this is the, 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 the Rayworth donut that tries to help us understand where we're falling short and where we're going too far. So if we focus in on the water, food, energy part, because um, that's, and, and when you look at the social foundation, these are the resources that, um, that we, we need. And of course, it's more complicated than that, but this is a, an attempt to break down um, the, the, in a simple way, an understanding of how these resources interact with each other. Note that all of the activities that are described here in this graphic also have major climate implications, but this focuses on the fact that in order to get energy, for example, we often use water in the production of that energy, and, but we often don't think about it that way. The same thing, of course, with food. We, I think we have a greater understanding that we need water to produce food, um, but we don't really think about the, the 
push and pull between energy and food, that land use um, is often implicated there. Um, we often don't think about the virtual water that goes into either the production of goods um, or food or production of energy. So you can see, you know, there, there are some examples here. Uh, bio, biofuel production re, re, is very consum consumptive of water. Desal, which or desalination, which we'll talk about later, um, is, is highly energy um, intensive in order to produce more water. Um, and of course, food is water intensive and energy intensive in its production. So all of these activities that we use to make, meet these basic needs for food, water, and energy have implications not only on climate change, but on each other. But we often are so siloed in what, how we handle them that we don't realize that. That is, some folks who are just thinking about energy think, um, OK, biofuels, the, that's an answer. That's a, you know, a better answer than fossil fuels. They don't think about the land use implications. I mean, some people would rather replace the word food with land use for that reason. Um, or similarly, folks who are worried about water access think, well, desal, I mean, the ocean is huge. Why don't we just pull more and more water out of the ocean? And the answer is because it's not just getting ocean water and transforming it into fresh water. Um, it's not just the availability of that ocean water, it's the availability of the huge amounts of energy that it would take. So we set all these sustainable development goals, um, starting in earnest in 2015, although they were conceptualized over a long period of time, starting in the Rio Plus 20 conference, or, or maybe even before, but really announced as a goal in the Rio Plus 20. But since 2015, we have these goals leading up um, to, to 2030 of how we're going to try to become more sustainable in, in how we develop. And you, looking at these goals, you, I, I think would note that many of them are pretty obviously connected to water, food, or energy. I mean, there are literally ones about water, food, and energy, hunger, affordable and clean energy, um, you know, water in a, a few places. But that even the ones that aren't, a, aren't obviously directly connected have quite a um, dependence on some, or in many cases, all of those three, and they're all also implicated in climate change. But the real danger is that many of the people working on each of these goals, and then of course, you know, that means that they're working for particular organizations or agencies, and they have maybe their own specific focus within this goal. Of, they're not thinking broadly always across the different goals and thinking about how fulfillment of one goal, zero hunger, for example, might harm another goal, climate action. So if you're going for zero hunger, you might just say, let's ramp up agricultural production. But oftentimes, that means converting land away from tropical rainforest, for example, in which case you're going to have a climate problem as you remove those carbon sinks. I think folks are getting a lot better about this, but there are still plenty of cases where people who are working in their little niche are not thinking about the implications for the other parts of the nexus or for climate change. So I just wanted to talk a little bit more about some of these examples. Um, I, I already started about talking about desal. And it's troubling to think um, how much we're going to depend on desal in the future. I think a lot of the Gulf states, um, the Arabian Peninsula, are already in pretty um, you know, far invested in desal because, of course, there's not a lot of fresh water and there is a lot of ocean there. Um, and they have all the energy in the world, in a sense, or at least they have a lot because they have access to, to fossil fuels. Um, and so it seems like an obvious solution for a place that is looking um, very, very vulnerable when it comes to water. Um, climate change is going to make water, freshwater availability um, very, very difficult, of course. Um, but as you invest in desal and use fossil fuels, of course, you're just fueling climate change and potentially making the problem even worse. And this has been called by some um, a, a prime example of maladaptation. You know, we think of humans, and, and it is true, humans are very adaptable. We are good at overcoming some challenges. But maladaptation is when we overcome challenges by doing things that will actually make those challenges worse in the long run. Beef production is a, oh, and I wanna, I wanna point out here that I, I, I wanted to offer some hope with each of these. So one possible way out of this is, is for us to reverse the disastrous course that we've taken by ramping down nuclear power 
um, at a time when, when we need um, clean energy more than ever. And I know the popular fears um, have led us to think of nuclear as neither clean nor safe, but in actuality, it is one of the cleanest um, sources of power if, if the average um, American fueled every aspect of their life, their home energy use, the, their, their transportation. Just think of every way that you use energy directly or indirectly with only nuclear for your entire life. The waste produced would fit into, I don't know why this is the example used, but into a 12 ounce can of Coca-Cola. Your whole life, all of your energy needs now, admittedly, it's not nice stuff, that waste, although it's not uh, as frightening as people make it out to be, and there, there are safe ways to dispose. Put that in contrast with coal, which um, is very dirty and produces tons and tons of waste on a daily basis. And so countries that we think of as doing quite well with renewables, like Germany, are actually not doing that well when you think about what they're replacing. They're ramping up renewables and, and they're using those to replace nuclear power, so they're having very little net effect. They should be shutting down coal plants, not nuclear plants. As and we should we should be definitely not shutting down nuclear plants, but investing in in the the best nuclear technology. Um, I think many would say now it has been a mistake. Um, similarly, with the the danger, I'd say that that's given that you know we can all name the, the big nuclear accidents, and there are a few of them, but only one of them led to, to human death. That's Chernobyl, an uh, aging, um, poorly maintained reactor at the, at the sort of end of the, the life for the Soviet Union. Um, and that you know, led to a few thousand deaths. Um, that's the same number of deaths attributable to coal every single day. So 60 plus years of nuclear, and we have a few thousand deaths, and every day a few thousand deaths of, that are directly related to coal through respiratory illness um, and, and, other, and cancer and other um, causes. Beef production is another example we might look at. Beef production alone uses three-fifths of global farmland, and often that farmland comes from deforestation increasingly because we um, are putting so much pressure to produce more and more, and yields less than 5% of the world's protein. Not a very good bargain. And each pound of beef requires around 1,800 gallons of water. Um, it's, it's a problem that, uh, you know, we'd like to find a solution that, that allows us to not change our lives. And this is where that, that discussion of need comes in. Um, but it is um, hard to imagine a way to make beef sustainable. And when we choose to focus our agricultural output on beef production, we're doing so at the expense of the most vulnerable and of future generations. And I think we have to wrestle with that. We should at the very least be pricing beef based on the greenhouse gases produced in its production and the virtual water used. Virtual water meaning the water that has gone in to the production of that pound of beef. And hopefully this would lead to a decrease in beef consumption. And finally, biofuels. And a lot of people are excited about biofuels, especially since this is a solution that aligns or a seemingly a solution that aligns with powerful interest groups. Um, the agricultural sector thinking, that's great, biofuels, we love this. And they're presented as environmentally friendly. And they may be in, in contrast with the worst fossil fuels, but they often have a pretty big um, carbon footprint because they let remove land from food production, which puts more pressure on other lands to be converted into food production. That again, leads to deforestation and it's a very water intensive process. So we should focus on truly I won't, I won't say on other carbon-free or nearly carbon-free energy sources such as wind, solar, and nuclear. And note that even those sources have their impacts. So if we're being careful of our, about our accounting, we would find that there is no real free lunch here. We are all, any time we are going to um, use resources, there's going to be a bill. And the question is, who's gonna pay the bill? So I guess I want to leave us with this, this thought. This isn't just a practical question, um, but it has um, a huge justice component. Because right now, the reason why we're not changing much about our behavior is because the bill is just starting to come due, and it's coming due to the most vulnerable first, and it will eventually come due to, to entire generations in the future. And so we should be thinking about that. And, and, you know, and we, we sort of wish cast this, you know, well, maybe in the future they'll, they'll develop 
amazing technologies that will save us. Um, and maybe, and I certainly hope we develop technologies that, that help because we're in a fair bit of trouble, but it's, it's um, an entirely unethical way to proceed to just do something very dangerous and hope that someone else who's gonna be impacted finds a way to protect themselves in the future. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I wanna leave plenty of time for discussion and I'm, I fear that I've already gone over time. So uh, my apologies if I have. Thank you so much, Dr. Terrell. Um, so we'll have some time for questions at the end, but I want to make sure that we have um, enough time to hear the second presentation. So next we'll hear from Dr. Kate Borisma, who's an assistant professor in the biology department and an aquatic ecologist working in desert streams and rivers. Her research examines the incredible adaptations that allow desert aquatic organisms to survive habitat dry, uh, drying and how these organisms might respond to a hotter and drier future. Borzma believes that human diversity is an essential part of the scientific process and works to increase the representation, retention, and success of women and other underrepresented groups in the biological sciences. So I am going to pass the screen to Dr. Borzma. So today I'm going to talk less about the human side and more about the, um, the natural side. I have a lot of photos here because um, that's how that's how I see the world, and beautiful photos of nature. So I'm gonna share a little bit of that world with you. Um, and we're gonna talk about what this means for, um, yeah, for, for local aquatic biodiversity, what this whole conversation means. So first I wanna start out um, with an activity. I would like you all to please write down, jot down in your minds or in your notes, the three most important sources of drinking water and then rank them in order from most important to least important. So like, I, I'm serious, you walk up, you turn on your faucet, where does that water come from? Enter in the chat um, your three most important sources in order of priority. All right, I see groundwater, Colorado River, lakes, Colorado River, NorCal. So yeah, we know it sounds like uh, from folks who say Sierra Nevada ice caps, recycled water, excellent. So um, we know here we don't get a lot of precipitation in Southern California, and so we need to be creative with where our water is coming from. Here in San Diego, um, we import 80% of our water supply. So about 50% comes from the Colorado River, um, which is coming down from Northern Arizona. And then we have 30% that are coming, again, melting from Sierra Nevada ice caps that are melting down into the San Joaquin River Valley here and then flowing downwards. A couple of you mentioned recycled water and groundwater. Uh, local surface water is about 10% of our local water consumption and recycled water is about 10%. And so recycled water includes the um, desalinization that Andy had talked about and also repurposing um, golf courses, reusing uh, water, that kind of thing. And locally groundwater is less than 2% of our water consumption. So um, water, very limiting resource here and we buy all that water and the infrastructure as you would imagine, to transport that water from Colorado, from Northern California is extensive. Um, and this is all for human use. And so today I'm moving us, moving our discussion into thinking about what's left for natural ecosystems. Um, and how will organisms respond to this increasing human demand for water that we're seeing? And to do that, we're gonna look into the desert a little bit, just east of San Diego. Here we are in San Diego. Um, and then this, so we are in a habitat called the Chaparral and Coastal Scrub, which is characterized by its low rainfall. But you'll notice that we're surrounded here by um, the Sonoran Desert and then up here, the Mojave Desert. And so we have a very low aquatic input into this region. So this is technically Sonoran Desert. This is our local desert, just over the hill on I-8, if you drive east from here. 
Um, and so this is technically Sonoran Desert, but you'll notice it doesn't look a lot like our Sonoran Desert that we may be accustomed to of Arizona with the large columnar cacti like saguaro. We do have some beautiful cacti here, but it is a very desolate landscape and there is less water in our desert than there is in the classically considered Sonoran Desert of northern Sonora, Mexico and southern Arizona. But I'm a desert aquatic ecologist and this talks about water. And so I'd like to take you on a little, a little bit of an adventure here into sampling this area and what that looks like and where the water is and how the organisms use it. And this is all um, with this sort of watchful eye of climate change and human water use, that this water that's available to nature is becoming less and less and less accessible. So we're gonna take a little hike in Borrego Palm Canyon. My lab group, we are aquatic ecologists. So we study living things in desert aquatic environments. And this here is Anza Borrego Desert State Park. And then this Borrego Palm Canyon is one location within that state park. And we're gonna go on a little field trip together here down the creek in Borrego Palm Canyon. So starting up in the headwaters, this is the oasis in Borrego Palm Canyon. This is um, my student, Brian Kelly, who is sampling some of the aquatic habitat there. So there's actually a fair amount of aquatic habitat in the mountains surrounding our, our, our Sonoran Desert. However, it's tucked in these little canyons and hard to find. It's also very spatially variable. And so as we progress from one part of this creek to another, the water variability, the water availability is highly variable. So it changes as we move from one part of the creek to the other. And as I'm focusing on this because most people, when they hear about desert aquatic ecology, or when they think about desert streams and rivers, um, they're not thinking of that variability. Our streams and rivers don't look like they do in the Pacific Northwest or in the Southeast or even in other deserts. We have very high variability. So this is that same creek just at a different part in the drainage. And this is if we continue further downstream and even further downstream. So that was within just one kilometer of this stream you have ranging from something that looks like a tropical oasis all the way down here to this little trickle of water. And this variability is it characterizes desert aquatic environments. That variability can be both spatially and temporally variable. So here in the upper left hand corner, we have something that's more like a permanent aquatic habitat. We call those perennial. We also have many intermittent habitats that may flow for only a portion of the year. And we even have aquatic habitats that are ephemeral, which only have water very rarely, maybe only once every few years. And as I just showed you from Borrego Palm Canyon, these can happen within the, the exact same stream drainage. This here is Coyote Creek. This is upstream and downstream. Again, here's another photo of uh, extensive flow upstream and then a dry channel downstream. And so these contrasts um, may make you wonder what exactly can take advantage of this highly variable habitat. The water isn't there predictably every year and the water doesn't extend very far across the landscape. Despite the, those really harsh environmental conditions, we see a wide diversity in this region. This is a sample collected from Borrego Palm Canyon on that field trip that I showed you earlier. And you'll notice here, we're not seeing fish or amphibians, but we are seeing a huge diversity of aquatic invertebrates. I'll play it again. You can keep an eye out for the stoneflies and mayflies. We have a caddisfly here in the middle, some dragonflies and damselflies. And these are all adapted to this super variable aquatic environment. And in fact, here on the border, we have one of the highest levels of aquatic biodiversity in all of the West. And that's because we have aquatic species that extend up from Baja and from the Sierra Madre, and they overlap with organisms that are coming down from the Sierra Nevada 
and also from the Rocky Mountains. And so we have this area of biodiversity overlap with very limited habitat area because of our limited water resources. So you might wonder, um, how are these organisms able to survive here, right? How, what special adaptations do they need to have in order to be able to withstand these extreme environmental conditions? Well, in the perennial creeks and springs that have water year round, we can see more traditional fauna that you might expect, including fishes, frogs, other amphibians, and our huge charismatic um, aquatic invertebrates. But when you move to more intermittent habitats, you find organisms that need to have specialized adaptation to deal with the absence of water periodically. Um, this is an organism called the, um, the net spinning caddis fly. And it builds this net in flowing current of water in these intermittent creeks. So it only lives in the creek for the short period of flow duration each year. And then it emerges and flies away to complete its, the adult phase of its life cycle during the dry season. That's a very common strategy where we see organisms that have synchronized their life history timing so that they're in the water during the wet season and then are able to emerge and have an aerial adult phase during the dry season. We even see organisms in our ephemeral creeks that only have water once every five years or so. When the water comes back, we have this huge burst of life that comes out of nowhere from these seed banks of desiccated eggs. So these organisms are actually able to dry up completely and then sprout again once the water returns. Here's another instance. This is an ephedrid fly. And these have these extended siphons so that they can actually extend out of the water when the water starts to retract. They can withstand horrible environmental conditions and, um, and then again emerge, complete their life cycles to avoid the drying period. So these are really incredible adaptations. And this, this is a, a high level of biodiversity given the harshness of this environment. And so I wanna talk just a little bit here about these adaptations to drying. What exactly are these organisms doing that's allowing them to persist in our arid environment? And more importantly, will these adaptations allow them to survive in our new future climate, right? Are the adaptations that allow desert aquatic organisms to persist during normal seasonal drying, normal seasonal droughts, are they gonna provide the, the resistance and resilience necessary in order to survive when those droughts become longer and longer? So the adaptations I'm talking about can be physiological, they can be life history adaptations, like the timing of life history cycles, the timing of reproduction and development, or behavioral. So I'm gonna show just a few interesting examples here of this aquatic fauna that we have in the desert Southwest that exemplify this capacity to withstand very low water levels. Here's a, one of our charismatic species, the devil's hole pupfish. Um, this is related to the pupfish that Dr. Raycar Gonzalez will be um, teaching us about in her extinction cross-stitch workshop, the Tacopa pupfish. These fishes that live in our region are able to survive uh, water temperatures up to 108 degrees Fahrenheit. We also have flies, like I mentioned earlier, that can stand pH, super, super basic pH, up to pH of 12. That's a level that would, would kill any normal organism. All right, that's my reminder that I need to wrap up. Life history adaptations include the ability to diapause or to actually hibernate for years on end. This is a stonefly that actually can crawl deep within the sediment during the dry season and then emerge five years later when the water returns. Some organisms are able to use behavioral adaptations to track the water as it's receding. This is a photo of long-toed long water beetles. And if you'll see here along the edge of this creek, they are 
following the water as it recedes. So this is a drying stream and they're actually tracking the direction of the water. We have other organisms that can track the water downwards. This is a Megaloptera. And what it does is it burrows in the sediment and has its, uh, it pupates during the dry season. So it makes these caverns that hold moisture during the dry season and allow them to develop in a way that withstands multi-year droughts. We also have some organisms that, that can persist by moving from aquatic habitat to aquatic habitat across the landscape. This is a giant water bug. These are about three centimeters long, about an inch long. And they're flight, flightless aquatic invertebrates. So this is one of our top predators here in our local desert streams. You'll see this here consuming a dragonfly nymph. And these are really important because they're our top predator. These are like equivalents of the wolves in Yellowstone, where they're keystone predators and they're maintaining a rich diversity of prey species in an area. However, they're flightless and that makes them highly vulnerable to changing hydrology in the region. So as streams dry, um, these um, and the fishes sometimes um, can be, become isolated. But even organisms like this have adaptations that allow them to, to escape these kinds of conditions. Um, this is a photo of one of those aquatic invertebrates, one of those giant water bugs, that is di dispersing downstream during a drought. So this is an aquatic organism. <laughs> it needs water for all phases of growth and development. But it's air breathing, which allows it to crawl over land in these extreme environments. So we also have some organisms that my students here at USD are working on to try and understand exactly what behaviors they're exhibiting in response to which drought um, cues. This is one, the crawling water beetle. That's a toothpick here. And it's hanging out under the water waiting um, for the time to fly from habitat to habitat. And so here, students are able to ask questions about how these different drought characteristics, conductivity, temperature, water level, affect dispersal in these different local species that are highly drought adapted. So we know that this existing, uh, the Pardon me. We know that the current cycles of floods and droughts characterize desert aquatic environments. But we also know that this is getting, um, these patterns are changing. And so here on this figure, we see um, precipitation minus evaporation on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And so this is a model that's projecting this transition to a drier climate. Precipitation minus evaporation can be interpreted as more precipitation than evaporation on the top part of this graph and more evaporation than precipitation on the bottom. And so what we can see is through time, we expect more evaporation. So a drier climate, less precipitation and increased drying of our natural streams and rivers. So the question that my lab group is seeking to address is given these amazing adaptations that we've been discussing, will the desert aquatic taxa be able to survive future climate change? Do these same adaptations that allow them to make it through seasonal droughts, um, is that insurance against our future drying? And if populations do disappear, will they be able to recover if water returns? So I don't have answers for you, but I do have some case studies here uh, that demonstrate that um, these changes are happening on an ongoing scale. They're happening right now. We are seeing losses of populations. Um, Andy mentioned that the changes might not be happening in decades, but years. And I would say they're happening right now. During the course of my PhD alone, I saw uh, extinctions of three populations of giant water bugs from entire mountain ranges in Southern Arizona and Northern Mexico. We're also seeing endangered species like this unarmored three-spined stickleback go locally extinct from several areas of its local range. And so these are desert adapted taxa. 
but these changes that are occurring now are exceeding their capacity to, um, to adapt. Now, one of the organisms, unfortunately, that is not able to make it so far is uh, the Tacopa pupfish. This is a photo of a close relative of the Tacopa pupfish that went extinct um, locally from Tacopa Springs. And this is the subject of Dr. Ray Carr Gonzalez's seminar, or pardon me, her workshop on uh, Ciprinidon navidensis, the Tacopa pupfish and its extinction trajectory. I encourage you to come and we will have extensive discussions about extinction dynamics and what we can do to, um, to try and challenge those, those trajectories. I'd like to end with a little bit of hope here. I participate in these two organizations, the Desert Fishes Council and Desert Fish Habitat Partnership, uh, who are working to ensure that amidst the, the scramble for water in the West, that the natural ecosystems aren't left out of the conversation and that we are considering the vulnerability of these taxa to increasing desiccation in their natural environment. So I'd like to thank all of my research students who've helped with this work. I didn't show nearly enough photos of them, but they're the ones who are doing um, the heavy lifting here with some of this research, and also the folks who work at Anza Brega Desert State Park, who are instrumental in um, conducting these longer term studies and tracking how the organisms are gonna change uh, with climate change in the future. Great, thank you very much. Oh, that was really a fascinating look at um, some of these aquatic organism adaptations and thank you for connecting it too to the workshop at the end of our series. I hope that um, those of you who are interested can sign up. So we're going to take questions now and I invite you if you like to switch to gallery mode so you can kind of get the experience of um, being in, in a discussion. Um, and if you have a question, if you want to go ahead and put up your blue hand in the participants tab or just um, write it in the chat and we'll have, we'll be monitoring both. So I'm going to ask Kate, a, I have a question for Andy, but I'll wait for other people. I have a question for Kate um, because, well, first of all, I'm probably one of the few people in here who thought how beautiful your pictures were because as an invertebrate person, I just love to see those animals. But one of the things that's always been even more fascinating than the fact that the trend seems to go to drying is that there's going to be also more variability in the precipitation and the evaporation. And the example I can give is just, was it, I think it's four years ago now when we had a, a, a rainstorm that dropped, you know, four inches in, in Anza Borrego in a two day uh, weekend in July when normally there's 0.02 inches. So how does that layer of variability affect the already existing variability? Yeah, well, I'm hoping that that my research can move in that direction in the future. The issue with those more extreme events, which is why you know we don't call it global warming anymore, right? We're more realist. We're realists, and we know that some places will get warmer, some will get colder. What we do know is that we'll see a higher um, number of extreme climate events, like you're talking about, and so these. Um, the problem with those events is that these organisms are using predictable cycles in order to adapt their life history timing, their, um, their emergence cycles. Those are all cued into these regular periodic cycles of flooding and drying. And so our concern is with, for example, a flood in July, is that, that the organisms aren't um, adapted to that environment. And so this is our key question, right? Like, if they're able to survive these multi-year droughts, does that mean they'll survive a decade-long drought? Are, are, are these adaptations that, are, that allow them to survive now, is that enough to allow them to survive in the future? And we don't, we don't know the answer. We're trying manipulative experiments in the laboratory to understand exactly what the cues are to trigger dispersal or what the cues are to trigger emergence so that maybe we can make predictions and model what might happen in the future when those cues totally change. I guess for both of you, but Andy, since you mentioned um, the concept of, of resilience sort of in connection um, with sustainable development, I'm wondering what, what sort of resilience looks like to you across the water, food, uh, energy nexus, climate nexus. Yeah, I mean, there's not a single answer. Um, we'll need to have a lot of different kinds of resilience. And we'll need to make sure that we are 
working on resilience and mitigation at the same time, right? Because we can be resilient, we will have to be resilient to some of the changes that are already happening um, and that will only get ex more extreme in the coming years. Um, but we can, there's only so much resilience, right? So the, the first key is that we don't mistake this as a problem we can sort of engineer our way out of. Um, there, there's a d diversity of opinions about what resilience might, might look like and what is, um, what should be counted as resilience versus um, what might be thought of as sort of a foolhardy um, attempt to control something that is beyond our control. Uh, some have argued the entire reason we have this big climate problem is we've been so keen to control our lives in the, the most direct ways. You know, I need the temperature to be in this tight range. I want to eat exactly what I want to eat regardless of the season that we've taken the wildness that humans grew up in and we've brought it up to, to a higher level and we've made our climate wild in order to make our lives tame. And so we don't want to make that mistake again in, in our resilience saying, well, you know, is Miami, they're just going to keep raising the streets as it floods. Is that resilience? Um, you know, it's debatable. I think the better kind of resilience is how we can respond to the problems um, that are affecting our communities, especially. I think we're best on that community level so that we can ensure that we are taking care of the most vulnerable and thinking about how we might continue to do the things that are necessary and let go of the things that are not necessary. That's why I really want to focus on need. I think a lot of it's tied up in understanding what we need, what we truly need versus what we hold on to out of stubbornness because we like it. We are used more, more than liking it, we're just used to it. And so I think a big part of resilience is understanding our limitations and trying to build our, our sort of our new lives around those limitations. Um, but there is a diversity of opinion because some some folks are all in on geoengineering and you know they want to put reflective material in the clouds and change how the whole system works i guess i've made it clear maybe indirectly that i think that's a pretty foolhardy way of, of understanding how we can be resilient um i mean some folks think we should go to mars uh, mars is like our worst case scenario right i don't know why we want to go to another planet that is as bad as it, you know how how earth would be if we totally ruined it but you know we have Elon Musk talking about colonies on Mars. So I guess there's a wide range of opinions. In my in my uh, thinking, it should be about focusing on how we can take care of our basic needs um, and get and making sure that we safeguard that while trying to mitigate the very worst damage that we're causing. Yes, and I guess a related question just came in from Cynthia Kaywood. So um, also for Andy, vegan alternatives to meat protein are touted as healthy, healthier alternatives. Are they also climate friendly alternatives, do you know? Um, or are they like biofuels environmentally costly to create? Yeah, and I think I think the the problem that we we come up against with the with alternatives is that we'd like it to be a yes no question, like, you know, is this good or or, or bad? We want it to be a sort of dichotomy and it's not. Um, the answer is better than than B. I mean, if you're going to buy a steak. Or, or hamburger and or instead buy an alternative. It depends what it's made out of. I mean, some are made out of pea flour and some are made out of soy, but soy is a common one. I mean, soy can also create, you know, lead to the, the ramping up demand for soy can also lead to deforestation because we only have so many places to grow soy, but it's, it's much, much better than the amount of the resources that would be, we'd have to put into creating beef. So it's, it's all about, you know, making significant gains rather than trying to find you know, a purity test for what is what is green and what's not green in the in the same way that we might say um you know some some forms of renewable energy or, or carbon free energy are are better than others but they're all better than than burning oil Everybody else, but this is for andy because i you know one of the things that comes up in in really changing our way of living with beef in particular is that some entire country's economy, or at least large portion, like Argentina, for example, um, are very, or Brazil, as it's damaging its rainforest, are very much connected to that. It's essentially their economy. And then taking that away becomes an impact on the poor more than it is on the rich farmers who make their money. So how do we balance out the need to be good to the planet with the need to be good to the countries whose workers are the ones who are doing all the work, especially in the, in the beef industry? That's a tough question, but I think this relates to something I see a lot, and it happened with the plastic bag ban 
in, um, in California where people said, well, you know, the people who will be hurt, hurt the most by the plastic bag ban are the poor because it's, the, it's a convenient way for people who don't have you know, transportation to carry things around. It's all absolutely true. But we seem to only ask these questions when it's about the environment. Nobody says, hey, it seems like all aspects of our economy hurt the poor. What do we do about that? Nobody wants to think about the poor when we're talking about like the economy generally. It's when we are trying to do something that actually would, would help the most vulnerable. So I'd say, yes, it's true. Uh, there are people who rely on beef, but that is, we have, and we should try to find a way to transition people. I mean, the real question is why do we have a system in which countries would allow people to fall into abject poverty because something that they're doing as a livelihood has to go away? What the answer should be that we, we pool resources and make sure that those people are okay in my mind. Um, this actually reminds me, I'll just say quickly, of uh, a quote from Naomi Klein, Klein who went to the Heartland Institute's uh, basically a, a climate conference for climate deniers and she said, there are all kinds of denial stories. It's not happening, it's happening, but it's actually not that bad. It's happening, but it's natural. And they're all wrong. The one thing they got right is the one thing that, that people who believe in climate change often deny, which is it's going to totally change our economy if we do what we need to do about climate. And she said, they're 100% right about that part. If we do what we need to do, it will totally rework our economy. So the impact on the, the beef industry and, the, and there are lots of people who are living on the economic margins involved, it will be real. It should be real. And we will have to find a way to take care of those people. But I don't think there's any way to keep the beef, the beef industry at this level and it's climbing because as countries develop, the, the demand for beef keeps going higher and higher. There's no way to thread that needle where you keep the beef industry going at current rates or higher and it's okay for the climate. The real question is, okay, we're gonna have to make a big change. How do we make sure the most vulnerable are taken care of? And that's tough in a place like Brazil, which right now is not really friendly to its most vulnerable. It is, um, and it's tough in a lot of places in the world, let's be honest. So that is a major, major challenge, but I don't see, I don't see it. And there are people smarter than me about this stuff who are working on it, and maybe they find some better answer, which allows you know, the continuation of the beef industry at the current levels are higher. I can't see it. Um, and I suspect it's just going to be a reworking of how, I mean, it, look, beef is the, the, the smallest thing I said. I basically said we should, I mean, I don't know, I kind of snuck it in there, but we should go from a growth-based economy to a zero growth economy. That's going to have huge implications for almost everything, right? Not just the beef industry, but I think it's a change we'll need to embrace. We'll at least have to go to tamp down our growth quite a bit and focus much more on development. And that might mean entire industries changing. Um, it would mean that, in fact. So absolutely, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, to that question, the same way I'm sympathetic to any change. But, the, but our whole economy is bad for the poor right now. And so, to add, you know, I think we should not ask the question when we're trying to do something that's good for climate change and which is ultimately good for the most vulnerable. We should ask that question about our economy period. Why is our economy driving people into extreme poverty? You know, in, in some places it's lifting people out of poverty, but in many cases it's keeping people in poverty and inequality is only growing. The gap is only growing. And so why is that something we allow? I think that's how I'd answer it. It's not a good answer to your specific question, I'm afraid, but I think it's because I can't see an answer that, that allows us to, um, to continue in the business as usual uh, when it comes to anything including beef. Thanks, Andy. But I think this, this kind of um, reminds us of the tension that we'll be exploring over this, over the course of this series between the human concerns and the non-human animal concerns. Um, so this question is for Dr. Borsma, but what other ecological roles do the organisms um, you described play if they can't endure a 10-year drought or more extreme climate events? What are some of the greater consequences for the desert environment and this is from Jana Peterson. Yeah, that's a great question. So there are kind of two talks I could have given today. One with starting from human relevance and one is starting from biodiversity conservation. And that's one of those dichotomies that's, that comes up all the time in sustainability conversations, right? What responsibility do we have to preserve the bugs for the bug's sake, right? Like who cares versus what, what is this doing for me? 
right? And I don't think that's the purpose of the question, but I, it is important to say that the, the both of those axes exist, right? Each of these aquatic invertebrates plays a functional role in its environment. And we have seen that with these climate transitions and the subsequent loss of some of these desert taxa, we see complete ecosystem conversion. So once these habitats cross a threshold, we can see complete um, ecosystem collapse. And that's defined by this fundamental shift in the community composition in, um, in a, a single location, right? And so the ecological roles um, in terms of humans, um, the, these are, some of these organisms provide um, bank stability. Some of these organisms are purifying the water. Um, some are just the base of a food web that we benefit from for fishing. Um, and there's also with aquatic invertebrates, there's a lot of export from the aquatic environment. So when I'm talking about emerging, all of these organisms that grow up, a dragonfly or damselfly that's a larva in the water and then emerges to fly away, that's exchanging energy between the aquatic and terrestrial environment. And that whole exchange gets lost once the patterns, those, those um, climate patterns in the aquatic environment cease, right? If those cues aren't there, then the organisms don't know when to leave. And those, those are aquatic terrestrial subsidies, we call them. And they're really important for our terrestrial ecosystem. So then we're not just talking about aquatic ecosystem collapse, but what are the bats going to eat? What are the birds going to eat? If that salmon doesn't have the organisms it needs, what's the bear going to eat, right? And so they, these things just, they're ramifications, I think, both from the human side down and also from the bug side up. And so I'm hoping throughout the series that we'll see these connections more and more start to form across these different aspects of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Our last talk um, should include a discussion of multi-species justice. And I think it will be interesting to think about that yeah. sort of from a humanities perspective in sort of returning back to the talk today and thinking about extinction and multi-species justice mm -hmm. um, from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. So thank you to both of our speakers, Dr. Terrell, Dr. Borisma, for wonderful talks.